Hi, my name is Hannah, and today we're interviewing Jacques. Originally from French, he is now based in Singapore. Jacques is an art dealer and art gallery owner. Today he gives us his view on key trends that require our attention as we emerge into post-pandemic world. This podcast channel is about you, successful international entrepreneurs, successful expats, successful investors, sponsored by htj.tax. Good morning, Jack. How are you this morning? Good morning, Darren. Very good, thanks. Fantastic. Please introduce yourself to those who may be watching or listening. Okay, so um, I'm French. I um, started my career as a coffee trader, physical coffee trader in New York and then in Vietnam. And then I came uh, here in Singapore about 14 years ago. So I was uh, a trader for a bank. I was trading currencies, Asian currencies. And after a few years, um, well, during that time, my wife came with me. I had met my wife in Vietnam and she was working in art. She was a consultant for a museum and uh, galleries. And uh, when the bank went through restructuring, we decided to uh, make a big jump and we opened our own art gallery. So it has now been um, eight years and uh, we are doing okay. So we are specialized in Vietnamese art. We have a gallery here in Singapore and we also do a lot of shows around the world. So um, we do about 10, 10 to 14 shows around the world per year in the wow. US, in Europe, and a lot in Asia as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, fantastic. You know, art I see as a great bellwether to uh, wider trends uh, economically, not, I mean, socially is obvious, but economically as well. So, and, 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 it's, and I think what's interesting is that you, transcend both worlds so you you, you understand finance you understand banking uh, as well as the as, as well as the art world so i think you have some great insights to share so where we are right now so that, obviously uh, i'm based in asia and we do vietnamese art or mostly mm-hmm. asian art and it's also okay. very interesting because we are mm-hmm. part of this opening of the world to asia mm-hmm. uh, culturally and uh, to um, carry asian art and present it to let's say the US or mm-hmm. um, Europe is very, very interesting because you see how people mm-hmm. perceive this part of the world and how much this part of the world becomes more and more integrated in the, in the world economy, basically. Exactly, exactly. So given what's happening now, you know, the pandemic and, 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 and the implications that is having on the way we do business and the way we travel, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, keep it really broad. What, what are your thoughts as to the trends that we can expect to see? So, well, of course, at the moment, um, everything is pretty much standstill. Uh, yeah. There's not much happening, right? Yeah. Um, I think we are starting to see a reopening. Uh, and I think it's going to be fast, actually, relatively mm-hmm. fast. Um, I, I think this, this is a big crisis. But in a way, we panicked a lot about it. I don't think we will see massive changes afterwards. The changes that will happen are changes that were already starting to happen before. Mm. So I think the main ones will be uh, working from home. So yes, it makes total sense economically for a company to reduce their overhead. have less real estate and ask people to work from home. Likewise, um, uh, education will most likely, maybe it will be slower, but it will move more onto online. Mm -hmm. So what I think is going to happen is that, well, we already have seen it. So um, retail, um, I'm focusing on retail here, I think, like supermarkets, something like that, will move more and more online and they already have done it. And somehow they, this business may downsize slightly. While an art gallery like we are, or um, fine dining, for example, I would call maybe 
premium a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think um, people will be more interested to have a contact with people. If you work from home more, mm -hmm. you want quality social interaction. Mm -hmm. And so I think we are going to see a slight shift in how retail works, where people who do have a, a shop or a, a business will have to take care more of their customers. Mm -hmm. While for all the retail that we, the everyday need, will become more and more of an online platform with mm -hmm. efficiency and less interaction. I think after this pandemic, thinking that people have been home for two or three months, they mm -hmm. will actually want to interact. And likewise, if you work from home and maybe go to the office uh, once or twice a week for meetings, mm -hmm. you, the interaction will become more important and you may actually want it to be better. Mm. And that's, that for the retail, that's the biggest trend I see. So for us, mm. particularly mm. an art gallery, I think the gallery will still do okay. And art shows will still be well attended because those events will be maybe even more important than they were before. Mm. Okay, so is it, if I'm understanding you correctly, I, I guess the first point that you made about working from home and more online education, uh, I get that, that's definite, no one can argue with that. But I'm interested in exploring the points that you're making about retail. Is it that you're seeing retail that will, it will like bifurcate in that if it is more of the commodities or perhaps uh, lower end transactions, that'll be easily migrated online. But if it is a more, that luxury experience, a higher end transaction, like buying uh, a great piece of art or enjoying fine, fine dining, that's the, that, will that will remain a, a high touch interaction that's more in person. And if so, would it change in any way? Is it would like, for example, could you see like if I wanted to visit your gallery in the future, would I need to make an appointment and I can't just show up? You know, is, how how do you see things changing? Maybe yes. I, I just think that we will people will expect better service. Mm. So for for this. Uh, maybe slightly uh, more high-end products, so jewelry, etc. They will mm -hmm. want people to be more dedicated to you. Like, we have seen a lot of online platform for art, mm -hmm. and I don't think they really work. I think they work as a, a place where transaction occurs, mm -hmm. but people will have seen the artwork before, because you need to experience it, you need to mm -hmm. spend time, now, where you actually make the payment is irrelevant. You need that moment where you talk to people. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a lot of, I think we'll see a shift, basically, where some things will go extremely efficient, extremely fast, and mm -hmm. somehow cheaper because of that. And another part of the market, which can be consulting, which can be many things, where social interaction will be there, but will have to be better because mm. people will want to pay a premium for a service that is more dedicated to their need. That's what I think. Okay, all right. And in terms of the way your, your business works, so you, you do a lot of international travel. Mm. Do you see that being impacted? Like for example, uh, international travel perhaps becoming a bit different as economies reopen? Because we've seen some countries that have opened, they're asking, okay, bring a health certificate. We, we will again test you at the airport. And then when you land, we want you to self-isolate for 14 days. Is that, you see that as a, a longer, a medium to long-term thing? And if so, how would that inf impact the way you do business? Well, for all our international business, mm -hmm. basically the fact of having a quarantine will stop totally our incentive to do anything overseas. Yeah. Um, so 
and I think a lot of businesses are in that situation. Mm -hmm. So of course, at the moment, that's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's I I expect towards the end of the year um, mm -hmm. to see a certain shift. I'm sure there'll still be regulations, there'll still be controls, maybe mm -hmm. some trackings or something like that of visitors. Mm -hmm. I doubt we will have something as um, blunt as uh, quarantine, which basically stops any travel. Exactly. Uh, unless, and it's yeah. the same for the tourism industry. Tourism mm -hmm. industry is very badly affected. When you think of some countries in the region, in Asia mm -hmm. and in the world that are that rely massively on tourism, this quarantine will stop it totally. Airlines, mm -hmm. everything. So I think we'll try to find ways to go around it. Mm -hmm. uh, I expect some some tools to track people and control and test mm -hmm. will be a smoother way and a safer way to uh, to start again this economy. So I don't think, for example, tourism. I I guess within a year will will go back to uh, well a healthy level of uh, mm -hmm. people traveling around the world. Okay, yeah, that's that's a fair point. I mean, the the idea of self isolating on each trip is it borders on being impractical. Uh, so hopefully we will continue to leverage technology. I see both Apple and Google have come together and are developing and deploying tracing apps. So, and of course, you know, as we were saying offline, that Singapore is considering a, a tracking bracelet. So technology would would step up. I think. I agree with you. At, at the moment, I think most of the travels we see are people who are relocating permanently. No. So. Mm -hmm. If you do that, if you are going to live somewhere for a few months at least, you don't necessarily mind the self-isolation of two weeks. Uh, mm. If you are doing business, this is just not practical. Yeah. Okay. I want to pick up on one of the first points you made, which also resonated with me, which is the idea that this pandemic may not necessarily have created anything new. What it has done, it has accelerated in some ways pre-existing trends. And one of the trends that many people have observed is the increasing wealth inequality. So, yes, you know, concentration of wealth in, in the Western economies and some others as well. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, yeah indeed it's the case. I mean, I, if I compare the current crisis we have, the previous one was maybe uh, 2008. And I think when we came out of it, it was uh, exactly that. Basically, um, the people who could borrow money for free mm -hmm. were well off. The people who could not, could not benefit from the prosperity. So mm -hmm. that what happened, um, for example, in France, where I come from, when you had the movement of the yellow jackets still goes on a little bit basically it's people who uh, who are told that we actually recovered but they haven't seen it because mm -hmm. they couldn't benefit from it mm -hmm. and so they are they express their anger i think mm -hmm. what we are seeing at the moment in america is a little bit the same at least yeah. it, it's the fear of that gap widening and um the the way economy are trying, the way government are trying to take the economy out of this crisis is very critical at the moment. I think, for example, in Singapore, we see a very interesting way of supporting um, people. Mm -hmm. They are trying to support the demand. Mm -hmm. I think in Europe, it's maybe not as spectacular, but it's maybe not too bad. The, the, the social network is pretty strong. In, in the US, it's a bit more um, concerning. I don't know it's, mm -hmm. uh, how it's going to happen. And obviously, the, the movements are because nobody really knows. So we'll mm -hmm. see. Uh, uh, without not talking about just uh, inequality in the country, but around the world, yes. I think like in 2008, mm -hmm. what we are seeing now is the strengthening of Asia. Mm. Um, I think Europe is pretty well off 
I mean, about neutral. Again, the question is a little bit on North America. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How is North America going to react? And we can see that China, at least, is reacting pretty fast. They're recovering pretty fast with a strong um, internal, de uh, internal demand. Europe, okay, just maybe doing well. Um, America, I don't think, is doing bad at all. I just think that America was doing so well before mm -hmm. that we may have a step down. And America may be more on a European level economically than, uh, than the beautiful years we have seen. Mm. So there's just this shift towards Asia is, mm -hmm. is going on. And in fact, that's where uh, we have a big challenge because I think we are going to more and more have to adapt to the Asian demand. Mm. So China is still a young market. Um, for art, for example, you see a lot of, um, uh, sorry, auction, auction houses selling yep. to uh, um, Chinese uh, billionaires. But talking about the middle class, which is starting to emerge, what is this middle class going to expect or what are going to be their needs we don't really know and i think in the next few years we will have to quickly adjust to this market which at the moment we haven't quite seen except if you are based in china or based in india or in a country around the region that's where i think the big challenge will be for the next 10 years I see. I understand. So again, looking at the pre versus post pandemic world, before the pandemic, China, China was growing, but the growth was slowing down a bit. Uh, do you see as we move post pandemic that their growth will, they'll continue to grow, but at a slower rate, or do you think they may reverse and accelerate their growth? What are your thoughts? I, I, I consider myself to be relatively positive about the economy, but yeah. I'm not positive to the point of thinking that it's going to accelerate. Sure, yeah. Um, I, I think yeah, China is maturing, mm. so we cannot expect uh, the, the, uh, the growth to accelerate. If it can be stable, it's, it's mm. already good. And I think that's what we are seeing in the region. We are seeing it in Vietnam, for example. Mm. We are... We are seeing, seeing it pretty much everywhere. Now, uh, a lot of projects are happening. Again, they have their own issues about inequality in the country. There's a lot of mm -hmm. things that need to be, to be changed. So I don't think we will see an acceleration now. Now, because of many things that are going to change in how we do business in the next few years mm -hmm. due to this pandemic and other things, mm -hmm. in a few years from now, the technologies we are developing now will become extremely effective. Mm -hmm. And then, let's give it another three, four years. I think we can see something very interesting because we see, may see a new wave of how we really do business. Mm -hmm. We are trying it now, we are developing it now. Mm -hmm. It will be effective in a few years. Okay, I'm with you. Because I, I asked that question because if the slowdown continues, then that would have uh, like a, a spin-off effect for Southeast Asia, because a lot of the Southeast Asian economies naturally depend on their relationship with China in terms of uh, supplying raw materials and, and you know manufactured goods and so on, satisfying this, the China market. And if, if it was already slowing down, and now we have on top of that rising economic nationalism, where, for example, France and Germany are saying, well, you know, we will probably import less and we will encourage our companies to look at alternatives. And Japan as well, they put up a $2 billion fund to help Japanese company relocate or restructure their supply chain away from, from, from China. And China's growth was premised on export-driven economic activity. Uh, it, you know, I, that's, I, I see that as a slowdown that would impact Southeast Asia as well. So I wonder to what extent have we seen 
the past the we've we've seen ourselves past the apex of the Asian growth story, and where there's a whole the market may mature. I don't see it declining because it's such a, a huge marketplace, but especially demographically. But I, I wonder if it'll just plateau off and whether the focus may perhaps shift a bit back to the West. Uh, you know, it's just one of those things that I've been thinking about. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think it may plateau. That's, that's true. That, um, and again, I don't think that's necessarily negative. Um, I mean, searching for a, a massive increase of GDP doesn't necessarily mean that the country itself is richer, actually. It's just, mm. I mean, it's an economical measurement that we don't, I mean, we keep using, but doesn't mm. necessarily make sense in the long term. Mm. Um, I th indeed, a lot of countries are trying to close down their economy mm. to bring back things home. Uh, if one economy is doing it in the world, I, and if it's a very strong economy, they may receive some benefit. If everybody is doing it, I think it's going so much against everything we have been doing. Mm -hmm. And there's no real need for it, except the political need. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think the economy will want something like that, that will obviously harm everything we have built until now. Mm -hmm. So it may be a short term uh, mm -hmm. thing. I, I don't see it as a risk on medium to long term. Okay. I think people will want to reopen and maybe mm -hmm. specialize, maybe develop new things and not compete on the same product. Okay, I understand. That, that, that's a fair point. And, and given the nature of your business is naturally puts you in touch with what's happening with, let's say, the higher income earners, what what trends or what movement do you see? Do you see like uh, in terms of migration, perhaps the higher net worth individuals may be considering spending more time in one jurisdiction, certain jurisdictions over others? Do you see any movements? Like, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, thinking about Singapore in particular, yeah. uh, I think what we have seen in the past maybe five, seven years, mm -hmm. is uh, a lot of the higher net worth were actually expats coming to Singapore, mm -hmm. very well paid, um, running um, banks and construction or transport company, whatever. Yeah. Um, those people are not necessarily here anymore. A lot of them were, are not here anymore. They were actually, either asked to relocate or they were asked to uh, stay here on a local package. Mm. So again, uh, that's it, that changes a little bit because in fact, that's a sign of maturity of Singapore. Indeed, because yes. they do not need to pay a premium for an mm. expat manager mm -hmm. when the country is basically attractive mm. and they have local talents. So, mm. um, we have seen a shift, but in a way, in, if you talk about wealth and if you talk about people interesting, uh, in, interested in paintings and, or uh, other things, uh, we, don't, we see a shift where it was very elite and now a lot more people are interested in it, in culture in general. Um, um, so yes, the market changes. Uh, I don't um, I would, wouldn't say that there's, uh, people are really shifting from one place to the other. It's just that demand is changing. And I think that's mm -hmm. where we have to be able to change the way we do business at the moment. We need to be able to change very fast to adapt mm -hmm. to that demand. And in a way, that's the beauty of being, mm -hmm. uh, to have your own company because yeah. you can shift much faster than, uh, than a lot of other people. Mm. That's the risk and that's the beauty of it. And I think that's, mm. that's actually our strength, to be okay. able to, uh, to, to change. So if there's a big change coming up, a few big changes coming up in the next few years, the race will be to know who is the most flexible. Mm. Indeed. 
Okay, so I want to take a, a little deeper dive into that point you made about uh, the the decision makers or maybe this, the, the C-suite execs in some of the companies operating in Singapore and perhaps in other Asian countries as well. At one point in time, they were disproportionately Westerners and now they may be more Asian, local talent, right? So do you see that, do you see that as a, uh, not just something that's happening right now that is a longer term trend? And if so, what impact does that have on, on, on your business? Um, well, I, I think basically, in the, okay, so indeed it used to be a lot of Westerners having the top positions and then yeah. uh, a, locals will, do the, will, have, will be the lower managers and below. Mm -hmm. uh, now we are, we are seeing a change, but it's not only the top uh, managers that mm -hmm. will become more Asian, it's also below where you will have more of a mix of people from different countries and you can see it here it's um, it's more harmonious in a way you have people from many different origin in many different positions mm -hmm. um, i think that's a good sign of how we are actually try uh, traveling interacting mm -hmm. when the world is becoming smaller basically and that's why again i don't think we are going to stop traveling anytime soon because mm -hmm. i think this is already in place mm -hmm. you have young uh, students just fresh graduates who will come to singapore for their first job they may be out yeah. of europe or america it's it's mm -hmm. it's okay it's normal mm -hmm. while it may have been the exception may even 15 years ago mm -hmm. so i i think that's that's a big trend basically mm -hmm. people are mobile and want to be able to work everywhere Mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily matter as much what is your nationality if you have the qualification. Mm. Okay, that, that that makes a lot of sense. Now, do you see? Let's let's talk and touch a bit on the, the geopolitics of it. Uh, with what's happening in Europe, as, I mean, you your friends, you're European. So perhaps even though you're still based in Asia, you have one eye from time to time what's happening in Europe. Uh, what, do you, what are your thoughts on Brexit? And not just Brexit, but the way in which Europe handled the pandemic, they, they seem not to be like a pan-European approach and everyone retreated. And then for the first time since we had the EU, borders were closed. So one European a national could not go next door, right? To, so what, what do you think the implications are to the European experiment? Um, yes, it's, Europe has been very weak in the way they responded to the pandemic. Uh, there's no common voice mm -hmm. and uh, in a way a few years back there was a moment where uh, French and Germany were aligned and pretty strong and it seemed like it could have been a revival of Europe. Um, I think we don't see that at all anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I think Brexit is uh, is not shocking anymore at all. Mm -hmm. People are not really panicking about it, mm -hmm. and somehow it it may become more like that. I think countries are um, maybe going to take care of themselves more on their own. I mean, mm -hmm. um, I don't see um, really a strengthening of Europe in the midterm. Mm -hmm. It will, it will take a big uh, change of leaders and uh, mentality for that. Mm -hmm. So I think economically, Europe is sound, mm -hmm. relatively, uh, but politically, they are weak. And uh, yeah, I don't see any, in the next few years, I don't see any massive shifts. What uh, actually Brexit becomes a bit of a non-event at the moment. Nobody is really talking about it, and that is an in interesting experiment. Mm. Now it's going to happen, and um, what is going? I mean, the UK made their choice already. There's no coming back. So how is that going to affect the way the UK 
is running their politics. And maybe what will change or what will um, dictate what Europe will be will mm -hmm. come from the UK. Mm -hmm. I think Europe will develop itself as a reaction to the UK. Mm -hmm. So we need basically a year or two to see what happens in the UK and mm -hmm. then Europe will strengthen itself or dissolve, but most likely it strengthen itself as um, a result to what happens mm -hmm. across the channel. Okay, fair. Okay, thank you for that. So I think my last question would be, in terms of recovery, do you see a U-shape or a V-shape? Um, hmm. I think it depends. Yeah. So it depends on particular in, uh, well, it depends on countries and mm -hmm. it depends on which uh, social trends you are talking about. Of course. Uh, Again, I think uh, you have um, the top earners mm -hmm. who do not necessarily mind what happened for the past two, three months. Mm -hmm. And then business may be back to normal for them pretty fast. Mm -hmm. While lower income, even if they have been shielded by government and help, may take a bit more time to be able to spread their way. Mm -hmm. so, Unfortunately, that means that there's a widening of the social inequality. Mm. Okay. Um, and for countries, much, most likely it will be the same. Some, con some countries will recover very fast, while mm -hmm. some will drag on, depending on what, what the government uh, did and what is the global uh, um, situation, basically. Okay. Um, of course, I 100% agree with you. So any, any final words, uh, perhaps, for other entrepreneurs, business owners who operate in the luxury space targeting uh, higher income earners? Any other words of advice you want to share with them? Well, I, I, I think what is very interesting at the moment is that we can create a business without having high fixed costs. Ah. And I think that's where we, a lot of things are changing. So we are doing, for example, uh, shows. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we have a, a gallery, but we are doing other things. We, are, we could move if we wanted to move. And I think that's where uh, things are very different from before. So you mm -hmm. can actually change from one year to the other what you do and how you operate. And I think it's not seen as negative which was the case before. Mm -hmm. you, uh, actually, to be creative is positive. It's not a sign of weakness. While before, to have a luxury brand, or mm -hmm. uh, you, you needed a beautiful location, and people knew you for that location. I don't mm -hmm. think that's necessarily the case. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to embrace that mm -hmm. to be able to adapt and be more responsive to the demands. Fantastic, Jack. Thank you very much for sharing your insights. Great. Okay, great. Have a great day. Have a great day, Darren.